Before we go on to the next section, I might uh, mention chiasm. Has anyone seen chiasm before? So in our contemporary literature, when you write a story, you usually have the major development near the end of the story. When you tell a joke, the major development's near the end of a joke. In ancient writing 2,000 years ago, the major point was often in the middle of the book or the piece of writing. And you'll find this even in a chapter. So if you have a whole chapter of ideas, often in the middle of the chapter is the key point. And one of the students mentioned Jonah, so if Jonah's got the whole book, I would expect that the key point will be in the middle of the book somewhere. And often the ancient people love to repeat what they did getting to the middle of the book and going back out from the middle of the book. And so often there's a, middle, uh, there's a mirror image in the second half of the presentation that matches what is presented in the first half. And so in Mark's gospel in the New Testament, um, the first 10 chapters build up to a point. Everything's going well. Jesus is doing great things. He's the Messiah. Great things are going to happen. And then right at that midpoint, halfway through, uh, Jesus says, who do you say I am? And of course, they say, oh, you're the great triumphant Messiah. Everything's going to go well. And Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to get, uh, suffer. Um, and it's through suffering and the cross that we go forward. And then the second half, is reflecting the great things in the first half, but moving towards the conclusion of the suffering. So you've got two halves that reflect one another. And we'll see this more next week in poetry parallelisms. The um, ancient people like to state something and then repeat it in the second line. So there's a parallelism. And so we see in a lot of ancient writing, there's a parallelism. The first half builds to the key point, And then the second half builds away from uh, the uh, key point. So chiasm. Um, describes that moving to a middle point and then moving away from the middle point. So make a note of that term, uh, look a bit further uh, at it. And uh, um, uh, again, knowing a theoretical concept gives you a lot that you can explore. You can Google it, go to the CHC Library online website, look up the topic chiasm in literature and in biblical literature, and that you can explore that. One of the things that we were talking about um, in the previous session is how you can have different uh, viewpoints and how dialogue can express different viewpoints. And we're going to come to Mikhail Bakhtin and uh, then the bottom of the uh, screen uh, there, you should be able to see the uh, name Mikhail Bakhtin, a Russian philosopher. He speaks a lot about different viewpoints in dialogue. Now, um, We've read Genesis chapter one, God makes the world all good. Da, 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 da. We've read Genesis chapter two, three, four, the world's got a lot of badness in it. Da, 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 da. There's Beethoven there. And um, how can you have these contradictions? I mean, you and I need to edit God's work for us. Um, if you want to do that, we have a bit of cult going afterwards. Um, <laughs> But God's given us these contradictions. And in education, in higher education, we've said this challenges you to think, to work it through and to own the new decision yourself as to what you think. And that's what scholars say the biblical editors and authors are doing here. They're challenging you to think. So Mikhail Bakhtin says, in dialogue, you have huge opportunity to think. Using two-dimensional thinking, if I was to ask you to choose between a circle or a um, rectangle, if you looked at the shape I've made here, hands up those who would see a circle, right? And then if I was asked another group of people to look side on at the object that I'm holding up here, how many people see a rectangle, hands up? How many people see a circle? And we've got, we've got a disagreement here. We've got confusion. We need to get rid of one of the groups and just keep the other group. But Bacton would say it's when you have dialogue discussing the difference that something much more creative originates. And so instead of having a rectangle, a cylinder side on, or instead of having a cylinder end on, or a cylinder side on, um, Bacton says a high way of thinking, yeah. 
oh, they're, they're not even seeing what I'm saying. So admit, admit, admit. All my wisdom has been wasted. <laughs> So um, welcome, uh, Jade Keller, Matthew. So welcome back. We're saying um, that um, I'm back. Um, if you were to look at a cylinder side on, you'd say it's a rectangle. If you look at a cylinder end on, you say it's a circle. But in actual fact, a dialogue will show that different perspectives more fully describe what is going on. And the Russian philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin said that dialogue is essential for human life to understand different viewpoints and to mature and grow through an understanding of these different viewpoints. Um, Juliana Klassen's um, 2003 Biblical Theology as Dialogue says that Mikhail Bakhtin proposes relations language are largely made up of dialogues and there are different viewpoints and different personalities in these dialogues as they come from people of different backgrounds and different approaches and different expressions. And so uh, Bakhtin says a plurality of independent and unmerged voices and consciousness, a pol uh, polyphony um, is going to help us find out what is real. Bakhtin says life by its very nature is dialogic. Uh, to live means to participate in dialogue, to ask questions. And then, uh, as the student said before the break, this encourages us to admit uh, humbly we don't know everything. Dialogue encourages us that there's other viewpoints out We need to be listening and open and uh, humble um, as we are open to the other viewpoints that are out there. So I've begun in this first session today talking about the importance of dialogue because I've suggested that this theoretical concept relating to dialogue and many concepts relating to dialogue could be profitably carried through in your analysis of dialogue in the biblical literature. And in other assignments that you do, I encourage you that if you have some strong theoretical concepts from strong thinkers and scholars, that'll strengthen your assignments and strengthen what you are doing. So Bacton's ideas on dialogue as uh, a discussion between people, I think, very valuable. And many scholars have therefore used Bacton in the study of biblical literature. Bacton argues that very often different forms of language and ways of understanding the world exist within a single cohesive text. For Bacton, authentic human life is open in the dialogue we really grow every year of our life for the whole of our life. And Bacton declares that each word and utterance is uh, dialogical in its nature. That is, we say a word, welcome students, but that's open-ended. The students will respond and, um, or not respond. Um, for all those on mine, unfortunately, we have a few sleeping here, but I'll go and prod them. And, uh, and so Bacton says that language sets off a change of events. Interestingly, Bacton says when Moses and the Exodus are written down, it doesn't just exist in that time, but when they go into captivity um, a thousand years later, they're going to use that and add to it. When Jesus leads the people in um, uh, 2,000 years ago, that's going to add to it. Bacton says, literature is never just what's originally written. It has a life of its own and catches new ideas. Develops, uh, further says, uh, Excuse me, Bacton. Sam. Yeah. Can I please interrupt? It's just, um, I think it might be Jade... Um, has left her mic on. Oh, yes, that's... I've just hit it. There we go. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate that. Thanks. So sometimes we need dialogue, like Matthew's, to open up the possibility of difficulties that are happening through the airways. And sometimes we need uh, mute to um, uh, remove some dialogue. And uh, when our uh, wives say, am I looking beautiful, or our partners, we need mute to preserve rather than the dialogue. So dialogue's important. Bacton declares uh, that words and texts cannot be heard or read in isolation from one another. So what are the words that go before that? What are the words that come afterwards? And so in Australian history, anyone who speaks in politics, they're speaking after 200 years of history. And anyone who speaks is speaking before another one or 200 years that are going to unfold in the future. Every one of our dialogues is in the midst and in a chain of events before and after us 
history and hope in the future. So Bacton maintains that words and utterances are in the flow of time. And he uses heteroglossia to describe the ways in which the presence of two or more voices and approaches and viewpoints um, in a text. So when we read in the biblical text, we should expect to find heterogeneous viewpoints, heteroglossia, different viewpoints. And so he uses the term diaglossia to also acknowledge that there's a dialogue going on. And he uses the term polyphony to describe the many voices that may be present. And one of the challenges for us is to discover truth in the midst of all of these presentations. Uh, so Bacton describes the potential for creating new meaning in terms of notions in great time. And so if you're looking at a book, um, I would encourage you, whatever assignments you do, do some good biblical studies, go back to the original time in which your assignment was set and write down what is the time. So we've got someone doing the Joseph narrative. I would encourage, go back and think, this is back around about 400 years before Moses, 1800 BC. And so some conservatives would say, the Joseph narrative comes from the setting, 1800 BC in Egypt. So you write a few sentences on that and scholars that hold that view. And then you think, well, really, it might have been written later at the time of Moses or later at the time of King David when there's a lot more writers. And so you go to scholars who say that 900 BC could be the time when it was edited and put it in the written form. And so you'd write that down as a scholar holds that view. And then some people, very liberal scholars who want to be free of everything, they would say it could have been written at 400 BC. So you quote a couple of liberal scholars and this shows that you're aware of the great range of viewpoints. And then you don't want to get bogged down unless this is your specialty that you want to do more work on. So you state that, you put scholarly references to show you're aware of that. But then you realise it could mean something to Christians or it could mean something through um, our history over the last thousand or hundred years or so. And then it can mean something today. But I encourage you probably in this subject, you don't want to give more than a third of your assignment to just what it means today, which is contemporary reading. That's very interesting too, what does Joseph mean? for people today. So that's one possibility. Whatever subject you're doing, I encourage you, look at the original likely context and background and date, then look at other times through biblical history, and then look at other times through history, narrow it down to the last 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years or something like that. That's irony. <laughs> and, then, um, uh, and then you can also look at contemporary readings, which are also very interesting. Denominations might read it differently as well. And so that's very interesting uh, as well. And, and when I did my PhD, I did a bit of wrestling with what did history mean back, the Bibles back, biblical times, through history, what did it mean in the last hundred years, and then what's it been psychologically, sociologically? So you look at these different perspectives and scholarly ways of uh, viewing things. And Bacton says, um, all writing then takes on a life of its own. And so in Exodus, we looked at uh, a little while back, the, um, people in South America read it as a liberation document that leads to a liberation theology that, that frees some people in Korea see uh, Exodus is speaking to them as a liberation document. And so um, each biblical writing can have its own um, liberation uh, there. So I'll put these uh, notes up on Moodle. And if you have trouble finding them, send me an email and then I can email you uh, the notes for each week as well. Just as an example, if you look at the story in Samuel 19, Jonathan um, uh, um, talking about his father, David's a good person, just accept him. That says how it begins. But 1 Samuel 23, there's a bit of a battle between Saul and David and uh, some of um, the people are going to lose their lives over it as well. And so you realise uh, Jonathan's viewpoint changes through the narrative. And so rather than a flat characterization that describes a person in one way holding one view, um, what scholars have said is that the views of Jonathan change, the attitude of Jonathan uh, changes. And so I'll put an example of an article that discusses uh, this uh, here as the voice changes as the narrative uh, goes uh, through. So um, uh, Brian Brock also in um, Teaching of Christian Ethics says that often we could go to Socratic dialogue as a way of understanding the power of dialogue. And so uh, Brian Brock, Prayer and Teaching in Christian Ethics, uh, Socratic Dialogue with God, says that there's uh, strength in Socratic uh, dialogue because it helps people consider a range of uh, different viewpoints 
and uh, therefore teaching's effective, not just giving simple answers to people, but encouraging discussion, working through of the different uh, points uh, there. And so uh, I encourage you dialogue with one another and uh, look at the uh, dialogue uh, there as we go through. So let's just um, run through. We'll go to the online people in a minute, but just ask the people in class, um, starting back row. Um, can I get you in pairs to talk with one another? So you two talking with one another, you two talking with another, you two talking with one another. What are the benefits of dialogue is what we're discussing. And then uh, moving on to putting it into literature, I guess, how do you show different viewpoints in literature, I guess, would be the second question. So what are the benefits of dialogue? And then how would you show it in literature, even the Bible? Thank you. I would like to see dialogue like day to day, or when is it the dialogue specifically to literature? Start with day to day, and then move on to literature, yeah. And so I'll ask online too, if you can speak to me, um, Jade first and then Kayella and then Matthew, what are the benefits of dialogue day to day in showing this in literature? Um, and then we'd, uh, and in uh, the Bible. So we'll ask Jade first. So uh, Jade, your thoughts, what are the benefits of dialogue day to day? And then we'll move on to in literature. Jade. And while we're waiting for Jade, we might move to uh, Matthew. Matthew, what are the benefits of dialogue? Um, <clears throat> Dr. Hay, Jade yes. just said in the chat she can't speak. It might be because ah. you muted her previously. You might have to be the one to unmute her. Yes. Now I've asked to. Ask to unmute. So I'll click on ask to unmute. Do you want to try it again, Jay, and see if you can unmute? Mm. Yeah, not happening so much. Thanks, Kayella. Kayella, do you want to tell us what do you think is the benefits of dialogue? Sure. Um, <clears throat> in the day today, I said. Um, it helps us grow as people. So I know you made a comment earlier about thinking thoughts we've never thought before. Um, mm. But I think also in dialogue, those thoughts are assisted in formation through engagement with others. So when you hear what someone says, you are considering it, you're adopting it, adapting it, or rejecting it from your own thinking. But it helps to, I guess, propel and um, support the considerations that lead to your thinking and then perhaps thoughts you never thought before. And I love those terms, adopting, adapting, rejecting. So does that come from an educational type idea, theory? Uh, no, they were just the three words that came to mind. <laughs> well, they're good three words. I like. And uh, thinking thoughts never thought and then adopting, adapting, rejecting. And I guess there's a weighing up, isn't there? And so you're weighing mm. up those uh, thoughts and then you're thinking uh, what's the consequences what's the benefits um, um, but I, I think the real strength of what you say is um, thoughts you've never thought before that's what brings growth yeah Matthew what are your thoughts uh, how dialogue helps with um, perspective um, forming your own understanding about things getting different perspectives on the same thing gives you a a greater understanding of the idea or concept or object and yeah it's good practice as teachers as well to encourage mm. that mm. and that of course means that in a business meeting if you've got a group of five it could be better than three um, because you've got five perspectives and there's probably an ideal size. And, and I guess the ideal size is probably somewhere around about seven to 12. Um, any more than that, you may not have room for the different viewpoints that are held. And then you could sort of uh, you know, have breakout groups um, for that as well. Yeah, that's great. All right. And then Jade, are we back with a voice or Jade's still 
got uh, electronic um, laryngitis, I think. Yeah. It's not opening up. I forced it closed. So after the break, it should come back, Jade. So my big apologies um, there. Let's go to the whole group now then, and then we'll ask the group what are some of the benefits of uh, dialogue as we uh, draw this uh, point together. Um, so brief statement, one person from each group. So let's get a brief statement, one person from each group in the class. So at the front, benefits of dialogue. And of course, in a well-rounded way, you probably got to show them reacting slightly differently to different people as well, and to situations, and working things through in the dialogue as well. And um, those taglines, as we said before, if you put a tagline and say, this person is nervous, and then you'd remove that later, but you'd then use that in what you're saying. Yeah, love it. Thoughts, dialogue, benefits? Um, tangling said you might have it some way to reflect um person in these persons where it's um we don't exist just as individuals, so we're not just one map collective the people involved, but there's a challenge involved um actually talking in dialogue between us, so we understand ourselves and all these dialogue in topics. Um and then let's draw it looks like reflecting the analysis. There is a um, continual going, showing how um, things change and adapt and that, and really trying to give a broader view of the world and understand how what's that from it, 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 it is. And you've got to decide which views are relevant and most true. And so you'll run with those. And then, of course, there could be all sorts of uh, different cultural views. You can't squeeze them all in. But uh, I think you're right. It does um, reflect the fuller view of the world. Um, and two of the terms that are sometimes used, one is autonomy. And so a fully functioning person should think for themselves. But there's a danger in individualism and autonomy. The other view then balancing this is heteronomy, where you think as a group and you listen to the other members in the group. The danger with heteronomy is that that can lead to group think. So if the group makes a decision, uh, like Germany in 1939, let's go to war with the rest of Europe, then um, if everyone follows that group think, then there's a lot of danger can flow out of that. So um, you find... Um, uh, that um, one person might stand up at, at, at a time like that and say, this is wrong. And so we do need some individualism and autonomy at times, but we also need some group um, decision-making as well. And so uh, I think many people would say we need that balance between the autonomous thinking individual and the group as well that's feeding information to the individual. And that's part of the challenge of life. And so the dialogue in literature could reflect those tensions uh, there. We could work with that. And uh, this group. When you had like the day day, um, the Mm. Yeah, and when you mentioned in that first one, the benefit for mental health, people, I think, certainly uh, value affirmation, but it has to be correct affirmation. So if they're entirely wrong all the time, then that's probably, um, you know, when you've got a 97-year-old still driving their car but constantly bumping things, you know, I can drive. Sure, you can still drive. You know. and that's irony again. Um, then uh, you have to be careful. But people, I think, 
do want a certain amount of affirmation. Um, I don't know how you go with uh, dialogues that are always quite argumentative. And occasionally you have TV shows that go that way. They start off very nicely and then they become more argumentative. So let's take our break uh, there. And uh, you've got time to uh, have a 10 minute break and then we'll come uh, back at about uh, quarter past to 20 past. So I'll see you uh, shortly.